The dictionary says that faith is a belief without any evidence to support it. It's not my intention to alter anybody's faith. Where I would draw the line is between faith and what I would call blind faith. And blind faith is a belief without evidence, not only without evidence, but in spite of evidence, but to the contrary. And I, I would draw the line there. I don't respect that. Somebody lived in the last century BCE and had certain experiences. That person came to some inward revelation. He thought about it and then he started to teach. Those teachings are recorded in the New Testament. And, and people who are not enlightened take over and they change it completely. And that's what happened with Christianity. I consider myself a Christian and I do believe religion is the highest aspiration of man because to me religion is a search for truth St. Thomas Aquinas made the famous statement that the only redemption is through Jesus Christ, and the only way to Jesus is through the Holy Roman Catholic Church. But how many people knew that Aquinas gave sanction to the Inquisition? The great early Christian scholar Eusebius stated early Christian frauds, deceptions, and forgeries should be revered by church historians. Quote, Nothing can impose better on the people than verbiage. The least they understand, the more they admire. St. Gregory. By order of the emperor, the holy gospels being written by a literate evangelist were censored and corrected. Bishop of Constantinople, great is the force of deceit provided it is not excited by a treacherous intention. In other words, as long as your intentions are honorable, deceit is not only good, it is great. I can't seem to find a good definition of a biblical scholar. You know, is it somebody with all kinds of letters after his name, or is it somebody who devotes his life in learning or lives his life at it? But whatever it is, it seems that scholars come in one of two forms. One is the apologist, and the other is what I call a, a neutral scholar, one without an agenda. An apologist is one who can take almost anything that comes up in any aspect of life and turn it into such a way that it suits his agenda, his beliefs, what he believes. In my view, a, a, a critical scholar without a, an institutional axe to grind very likely began as an apologist. Uh, often, uh, that, that happened with me and with many people I know, where you get interested in the Bible because you're an avid Christian and you just can't know that Bible well enough. But then the further you delve into it, you begin to realize, you know, this, this would make a lot more sense without the uh, creed I was taught because the more I understand about it, the more of a clash I see. Uh, I may have to make a choice and eventually decide, all right, I'm just going to follow the evidence wherever it leads. The neutral scholar, and I would hope I would be in that category, is somebody without any axe to grind, somebody without an agenda, somebody that can, can painstakingly rid himself of the previous biases and prejudices and just try to get at the truth the way it is. Exodus 4, 21, 22, and 23 has God teaching Moses how to cope with Pharaoh. Pharaoh does this, you do that. Exodus 4, 24, the very, very next sentence, has God searching for Moses in order to kill him. Kill him. 
This is a puzzle, and I've presented this puzzle to many, many theologians, experts in their field. And the first one I would present it to is what's known as a Bible literalist. A Bible literist is one who believes that every single word in Scripture is inspired by God Himself. So I would say, Reverend, how do you explain Exodus 4.24? The answer is always the same. Who am I to question the Word of God? God works in mysterious ways. In other words, go away. Then the Christian non-literalist. And this would be the Protestants and such. So I go to one of those and say, Reverend, how do you explain Exodus 4.24? The answer is varied, but it usually comes out something like this. Well, it says this, but it really means that. In other words, they're not taking the words literally uh, and, and they're changing it around to mean something else other than what it, what it exactly says. Then the priest, Father, what's with Exodus 4.24? And these people all know about this. And his explanation, um, you know, varies somewhat, but basically what they're saying is... Son, in our faith, we have not just scripture, but we have dogma. And dogma is the divine information which will explain this or any other thing that you may come up with in scripture. In other words, a very generalized answer. And then the rabbi. Hey, rabbi, this is your book. You guys wrote this. What's with 424 Exodus? Eh, somebody screwed up. So what have we got here? We've got four professional, highly intelligent, well-educated, very sincere experts reading the same few words, just a few words, and coming up with notions none of which even resembles the other. And now we're getting a little bit into the problems with Christianity. There are many aspects of Christianity that are practiced and believed today that are just assumed. There is nothing in Scripture to support these assumptions. In an example, we have Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the authors of the Gospels. Not true. These are assigned names. Some churches have even personalized and canonized these names. There is now St. Mark and St. Matthew which seems strange considering we do not know who these people really were. Uh, those names are never mentioned in the text of the Gospels themselves, so they are sort of assigned by later editors for convenience. We, so if you read the Gospels, they don't say who wrote them. Uh, they belong on those scrolls as an editorial device. Uh, they didn't actually assign them names uh, until people had a collection of Gospels. It is assumed that in the Garden of Eden, Eve tempted Adam with an apple. There is nothing in the Bible about an apple. It is the fruit of the tree of knowledge. There is an assumption that after the birth of Jesus, three magi brought them frankincense, myrrh, and gold. The word three is never used. And an earlier guess uh, from the early church was that there were 12 of them, but that was a guess too, it just doesn't say. Nor does it say there were kings or that there were three different ethnic groups or any of that stuff. Jesus is called by many the Prince of Peace. However, in Matthew 10, 34, Jesus in essence says, Think not that I have come in peace, but with a sword. Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Not so. Scripture says Jonah got swallowed by a great fish. People think that the Bible has 10 commandments. The Bible has 613 commandments. They are in the Torah. And they address just about every aspect of life, including how to sell your daughter in servitude and how to treat slaves. And my favorite one is if you have a disobedient son, what you do is you take him out beyond the city walls and you kill him. Kill him. I wonder how the Bible literalists treat that. I hope they don't have any disobedient sons. The second commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. 
or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. In the Jewish and Muslim religions, there are no signs or images of any kind. In other words, they follow the law. The Christian religion, however, does not follow the book as the church allow crosses, paintings, statues, etc., which violate the second commandment. They justify this by saying that you can make them as long as they are not worshipped, but this is not what the book says. Another assumption by some Christian denominations is that it is forbidden theologically to drink alcohol. I don't know where that comes from, because the opposite uh, comes from the Gospels, is that uh, drinking was part of the Jewish religion, especially the Passover, uh, Seder, the feast. Uh, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. I mean, what did he do this for? Not to sprinkle the roses with, but to drink. So this whole idea of, uh, of alcohol is forbidden by the Bible is, is not true. Catholics call their priests father. Jesus says, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. The depiction of Jesus on the crucifix has only existed since the sixth century. Before the sixth century, early Christians depicted an empty cross or a crucifix with a lamb on it. Many ancient religions are derived from astrology and astronomy. In what's called the procession of the equinoxes, the ancients divided the sky into 12 sections based on the rotational sequence. These sections are referred to as the house of the zodiac. At the time of Jesus' birth, the house of Aries, which was symbolized by a ram, was transitioning into the house of Pisces, which was represented by a fish. This is why Jesus was called the Lamb of God from the Aries ram and the symbol of the Jesus fish is associated with the house of Pisces. When Herod asked the wise men at what moment did they see the star of Bethlehem rise, he was wondering if this was the equinox and at the time when it changed from the house of Aries to the house of Pisces. We see, for example, in ancient synagogues that there are astrological signs that are, 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 uh, are portrayed there in mosaic. So it was clearly an operative science, so to speak. It is assumed that Jesus had long hair, a mustache, and beard. Jesus was originally depicted as clean-shaven and having short hair. It wasn't until hundreds of years after death that the long hair and beard was added. Many Greek and Roman gods had long flowing hair and beards. The Christians wanted to up their status of Jesus by comparing them to Zeus and Jupiter to prove their god was as good as theirs. What does this mean for the Shroud of Turin? if that is indeed historically accurate. The Shroud of Turin is like a sheet, and imaged on it is an outline of a human. Many people believe that this was the shroud put on Jesus when he was brought to the cave after the crucifixion. Besides having long hair and a beard, which contradicts the original clean-shaven Jesus, the shroud depicts a man close to six feet tall. The average Jew in those days was closer to five foot four. See if you can guess this religion. December 25th, a savior is born, an extraordinary birth. It was witnessed by shepherds and magi who brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. He had 12 disciples and performed miracles such as healing the sick and raising the dead. He was baptized and practiced the Eucharist. He was killed and he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. The symbol of the supreme being was a cross, and the sacred day of worship was Sunday. And he was referred to as the truth, the light, and many, many others. Anybody would say Christianity, but it's not Christianity. It was Mithraism. And that sun symbol of Mithraism spills over today in things like uh, wedding rings, which are a band symbolizing the corona of the sun and the halo that the uh, Angels and saints and um, Jesus and people like that uh, had halos or, or coronas of the sun. This is just incidental carryovers from Mithraism. But my question 
then is. Is it some sort of accident that the description of Christianity is essentially the same as the description of Mithraism? Mithraism preceded Christianity by 1,000 years, and it ran side by side with Christianity for several hundred years until Mithraism died out and Christianity prevailed. The time both were initiation or mystery religions, both had a, a conquering savior, uh, both um, attracted sun god imagery. It wasn't until the fifth century that Pope Leo the Great commanded that his subjects stop worshiping the sun. I'm talking about his Christian subjects. So I think it kind of grew from various uh, sources and was cobbled together. And who knows when, when it started. I don't want to argue in a circle and just assume it began with a historical Jesus. I doubt it did. In fact, you could go back centuries with the Essenes and the Gnostics and the dying and rising God fertility cults where these myths just come together, whereas there is no one point of origin. Scholars disagree on how much, if any influence, Mithraism may have had on any origins of Christianity. The similarities between them are a common motif throughout history and originate from astronomical or astrological beliefs that can be traced back thousands of years. Really where the action is, is uh, with uh, Jesus himself, because it seems to me that the parallels between him and uh, Osiris, Attis, Tammuz, Baal, and other gods who were considered non-Jewish from a later standpoint, but were certainly in the biblical matrix, I think they became the dying and rising God, Jesus. Many of them had sacraments and myths of initiation, and uh, we know uh, Osiris did, for instance, and that he was known in, in uh, Israel for probably thousands of years when, from the time Egypt ruled Canaan, before Abraham even, and they knew all about him. Uh, they rewrote the Osiris story as the story of Joseph. And uh, so I think Jesus is the paramount case of a, of a pre-Judaism God who becomes a, a Christian, the Christian savior. Numerous other religions and their icons around the world are evidence to have similar beliefs. The significance to this commonality seems to be a tradition of astronomy. Even Jewish tradition says, when Aries is over and Pisces start, the Messiah will come. When one house was ending, it meant that from an astrological perspective, a paradigm shift was occurring as one house transitioned out and a new house or sign transitioned in. The meaning related to the world changes in collective consciousness. This was a notion by many ancient religions such as the Maya prophecy, whose world shift takes place in 2012. Some scholars believe adamantly that the only single thing original to Christianity itself is the church. There is absolutely nothing else in their beliefs that cannot be found directly in many, many other religions of the day. There are tales in the Old Testament for which there should be a large amount of archeological remains had they been true. As far as Nazareth, uh, the evidence itself goes, um, there was a settlement there until about uh, 700 BCE when the Assyrians came in and conquered. They destroyed all the towns in the vicinity, including the settlement that was in the Nazareth Basin, which went under the name of Yafia. At that time, that's where Yafia was. And then nobody lived there for about 800 years. And then people started coming in again, you know, about 70 CE, after the time of Jesus. And there was a town there in middle and late Roman times. So well after the time of Jesus, you had Nazareth. This is according to the pottery, the tombs, and the opinions of the world's foremost experts in the field who have dated those artifacts. Um, which tells us that Nazareth did not exist at the turn of the era when Jesus is supposed to have existed. 
With over two million Jews, along with their belongings, their relatives, and their herds wandering the desert for 40 years, there should be thousands of pieces of evidence to confirm this. There is none. Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho and brought the walls down when his Israelite army marched around the city blowing their trumpets. They then proceeded to kill every man, woman, and child as instructed by God. There's two things wrong with that story. Number one, in those days, Canaanite cities uh, didn't have walls. And the second one, which is more important, that in those days, the city of Jericho didn't exist. Nor did the next one, the city of Ai, did, or nor did um, most of the other cities that Joshua, according to the Bible, uh, conquered. As far as the New Testament, there are things which should be found that cannot be found by archaeologists. As an example, Joseph of Arimathea, another key figure in the New Testament. Arimathea has never been found. They ought to be able to find these things, and they can't. And Frank Zindler um, has uh, researched other places, um, Bethany, Bethabara, and so on, and they also don't seem to have existed. Um, you know, at the turn of the era. So a lot of the places, archaeologically, <clears throat> the setting for Jesus' ministry um, is bogus. These places did exist, however, about 100, 150 years later, which is a tip-off that the uh, Gospels um, were written and edited. They don't actually have to have been written 150 years later, but they were edited as late as that. Um, so a lot of the stuff in the Gospels reflects a later time, and this is pretty evident anyway from other uh, clues that we have. It says, it's not that ancient people told literal stories that we are now smart enough to take symbolically, but they told them symbolically and we are dumb enough to take them literally. Well, the word Messiah just means somebody that's an anointed, and you can be anointed to be various things, not just to be a king, but to be a priest or to be a prophet or whatever gets anointed, sort of a coronation we might put in modern terms. There was no one Messiah. In fact, different groups had an idea who they thought would be the Messiah. The hope of the Jews was that some descendant of David would again become king and kick out the bad guys and set up a nice Davidic dynasty and empire all over again. So that was the original idea of what we call the Messiah. In Jewish tradition, the coming of the Messiah would unite the 12 scattered tribes, rebuild Solomon's temple, overthrow the yoke of the oppressors, and at the time it was the Romans and restore the Jewish nation to greatness in order to prosper for 1,000 years. The Messiah would be from the house of David. That's why the New Testament begins with the genealogy of Jesus, to show that he had met the requirement. However, the Jewish Messiah was not a Prince of Peace, nor was he divine. Here's the most important thing about the Messiah, is that he would be king of the Jews, and a warrior king. In Jewish tradition, Jesus thought he was the Messiah and may have met some of the requirements that describe what the Messiah was. However, he did not meet the requirement of a Jewish warrior king. Jesus says the opposite. He says, turn the other cheek, love thine enemy, render unto Caesar what Caesar's. This is in direct conflict with the main expectation of the Messiah. And all through the Gospels, he never ever says that he's the Messiah, much less he's divine. Jesus never admits that he is the Messiah until he is before the head priest who asked, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. The Christ means the Messiah. Jesus knew that he would be put to death by claiming that he was the Messiah. Only Caesar can appoint a king. Therefore, the statement he made to the high priest was treason. Arrest 
there have been over 28 proclaimed messiahs in Jewish history. Jews in general have refuted all of them, including Jesus. The first Christians that we know of were called Ebionites, translation, the poor ones. They were very low in the socioeconomic status. Christianity attracted the slaves, the poor, and the women who at the time were second-class citizens. Uh, the, the Ebionites claimed to be descended from the first Jerusalem church, whom Galatians refers to as the poor, which is what that means. The, the, the uh, Essenes call themselves the poor, too. Uh, and that raises the question, well, were these first disciples of Jesus part of the Essene movement? And if they were, does that mean they were part of a broader Jewish Gnostic baptizing movement in the Jordan Valley, uh, which I, I think they were. I think there's all manner of evidence for that, so that Jesus would have been one of several figureheads of a sect, too. So which one of them, like, where do you want to place the origin of Christianity? Did it split off from an earlier movement? Uh, did several of them split off with different Jesuses? We even have strange references in the uh, Second Corinthians. If anyone comes to you preaching a different gospel and another Jesus, you accept it readily enough. I don't think that's just a metaphor. There were other heroes named Jesus at the time, including Jesus, son of Ananias, whose story of persecution by the Jewish authorities and the Roman procurator on the eve of the fall of Jerusalem is so parallel to that of Jesus that some scholars think that the gospel passion has simply been borrowed for the story of Jesus van Ananias. Ebionites believed that Jesus was the Messiah. The first known Christians not only believed that Jesus was the Messiah, they believed that he was the product of a normal birth, a normal mother, and a normal father. So they probably did not think Jesus was divine, because if they did, that would be breaking the first commandment. Uh, we, Thou shalt have no other God before me. So I rather doubt that the Ebionites thought Jesus was you know, God or in fact, I, I don't think even the, the Gospels, uh, most of the Gospels think Jesus was divine. I think that, uh, or, or at least God. I think the Trinity is a, a later development. And here's what they did believe. They believed that the Apostle Paul was the Antichrist. The Antichrist. Where Jesus says you can change nothing in the law, Paul, several places said, Jesus has freed us from the cursed law. Mainly, he's saying this to Gentiles who don't want to go through the Jewish dietary laws and the, Jews, and the circumcision and all the other things that Jews believed in those days. And said, do away with all that because Jesus has freed us of that. And this is not what Jesus said. And this is not what the Ebionites said. And the Ebionites were there on the spot. They were not from a different country or a different culture or a different language. They were there. At the time of Jesus, Israel was ruled by the Romans. The Romans are known to be prolific writers of events of the day, yet there are no known contemporary writings about Jesus. I mean, if he was able to feed 5,000 people with a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread, one would expect this to be headline news, or at least mentioned in some of the writings of the Romans, which were there. Uh, it's true. We have not a single, not one single document from the first century mentioning Jesus. The earliest New Testament manuscript we have, and it's just a little scrap, it's called P52, and it dates from around 125. And that's the earliest thing we have. You know, you don't really get anything more complete until the second, third, and fourth centuries. So in between is a gap of uh, at least 100 to 2 hundred years. What was filled in, what was taken out from that tradition, we don't know. Because I'm one to argue you cannot reconstruct the text of the New Testament, the original text. It, what you would need to secure a historical Jesus would be contemporary references and letters, such as we have about other figures like the cynic Peregrinus or the uh, 
the sage Apollonius of Tyana or various exorcists where we happen to have letters where people said, I met this guy, he's not so bad, and so forth. We just don't have that about Jesus. I don't think the Romans knew anything about him and cared anything about him. He was a troublemaker and they got rid of him and that was that. The first thing we know about Jesus comes from the Apostle Paul, possibly written in the 50s or early 60s. These are the earliest writings that we have about Jesus. The Agenda of Paul. There were significant differences in the agenda of Jesus to that of Paul. One of the most important verses in the New Testament is Matthew 5.17. In 5.17, Jesus states why he is here. Matthew uh, 5, 17 through 19 says, uh, Don't think I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I came not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Uh, it would be easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for a jot or tittle to pass away from the law. The law that he is referring to is the Torah, which is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible and what Christians called the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible and the prophets Jesus speaks of comprise the foundation of Judaism. Jesus is saying, think not that I have come to challenge Judaism, but to fulfill it. Jesus was a reformer. His mission was to bring the Jews back to the old ways of theology. He goes on to say, you change not a jot or a tittle in scripture. What does that mean? That, that means that a jot and a tittle are the little decorative squigglies that you put onto a Hebrew letter he says you don't change, a, he doesn't say you don't change a law, you don't change a, a philosophy or a thought or a paragraph or a word you know, or even a letter. You don't change the tiniest little part of the law or the prophets. You change nothing. This is what he wanted to get back to that practice of, of, of what the scriptures say. Because Jesus is depicted as rebutting in advance Christian beliefs about what Jesus came to do. Paul says the exact opposite of Jesus. Paul could not convince Jews that Jesus was divine, so he went outside of Israel to the Gentiles. A Gentile is anyone who is not a Jew. And wasn't getting any place again uh, for two main reasons. Number one was the dietary law. He restricted the things that they enjoyed and ate all the time. But the biggest one was the circumcision law. In the first century or so, most all Christians were Jews. But Paul said you don't have to keep the Jewish law. That's a legalism and you're saved by the blood of Christ, not by keeping the Jewish law. So that he admitted Gentiles without circumcising them, without requiring them to observe Jewish dietary policies or going to the synagogue on Saturday. As a result, there developed what we call today two confessions or two denominations, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. But it took a long time for that bifurcation to take place. A lot of the so-called Gentile Christian church were Jews, but they didn't continue observing Jewish practices, thanks to Paul. But the point that I'm making is that Jesus says, I'm here for this, and Paul says, I'm here for that. Jesus says, you change absolutely nothing, and, and he brings it to a, an extreme uh, degree. And Paul says, we don't have to obey those cursed laws. Jesus has freed us from them. Of course, that's not what Jesus said. Remember, the word apostle was reserved for those who were with Jesus and witnessed his doings. Paul claimed to be an apostle, and the Christian church calls him an apostle. Even though he was not involved or even knew Jesus, he had died long before Paul. Well, if you take uh, the conventional Christian Lutheran sort of a view of, of Paul, he is uh, a convert from Judaism to Christianity. Paul not only becomes a follower of the sect he persecuted, but imagines himself to be an apostle 
and an authority on Jesus. Out of nowhere, the guy says, you know, I'm not only a Christian, I'm an apostle. I'm on the level with the guys that Jesus actually taught. And uh, he, uh, however it happens, he doesn't say in the epistles, uh, the uh, stories in Acts of the Damascus Road are transparently borrowed from the conversions of uh, Pentheus and Euripides the Bacchae and uh, uh, Heliodorus in Second Maccabees chapter 3, well-known works at the time. But however it happened, he, he becomes a, uh, a Christian and decides that uh, the Torah is no longer binding that Jews uh, may keep it if they wish, but they're, they're grossly mistaken, even to the point of spiritual peril, if they think they must. Uh, he describes himself as being uh, born into the Jewish tradition, but he does not think we, we should follow the law as Christians. Uh, and he's being opposed there by Cephas. A lot of people say it's Peter, um, who was an actual disciple of Christ. Now, in any argument, between Peter and Paul, guess who would have the advantage, right? It wouldn't be Paul, it would be Peter. Peter could say to Paul all the time, listen, uh, Paul, I was with Jesus. I was a friend of Jesus and you are an interloper. You, you've never even met the guy, right? Uh, so who are you to tell me what Jesus thought? I was there and you weren't. Uh, so it's in, actually interesting that this non-disciple of Jesus ended up being so dominant in early Christianity because, you know, he never met Jesus by his own account. Everything he got, uh, he got from Revelation. How are we to verify that Jesus actually revealed anything to Paul? And clearly, a lot of the early Christians did not agree with him. And so Paul insists in Galatians that he was sent by the resurrected Christ and made the point, I'm as much sent as you are. And if you knew Jesus before the crucifixion, that doesn't make a bit of difference. Everything is new now in 2 Corinthians. Now, this seems to be the tip of an iceberg, though, where he's trying to decide a larger issue. If these Gentiles who really like our new religion want to join, but don't want to become Jews, uh, and this was very common. There were loads of Greeks and Romans going to the synagogue every Sabbath. And I said, this is great. This is better than the pagan garbage we were brought up with, these bed-hopping deities and so on. These people have a real uh, uh, faith here. But uh, to tell you the truth, I don't want to get circumcised. I don't want to stop having uh, shrimp cocktails and ham sandwiches. Uh, do you mind if I just attend and listen to the scripture and the sermons? And the Jews said, come on, no problem. Uh, you're not Jews, but that's all right. Well, that's the kind of issue facing Paul. I got these people lining up to, to be baptized as Christians. Do I have to tell them they've also got to be circumcised and no more ham sandwiches? Because if I do, they're going to leave. Uh, and it, can it be that important? This raised a huge problem with the Ebionite. They said, look, I mean, uh, it may not be the most important thing, but Jesus is the... Jewish Messiah. I mean, what what's the last thing you think the Jewish Messiah is going to do? Is say, let's let's just drop the Torah of Moses. We don't have no way. This is all right. It's the least of the commandments, but there's no way the Jewish Messiah is going to say that Jewish law is unimportant. So I said, this Paul is an antichrist. He's a false apostle. He's a servant of the devil, especially the Ebionites. Oh, they really hated him. But Matthew did too. But remember what Jesus said, I keep saying, Matthew 5, 17, Think that I have not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And then he goes on, he says, you change nothing. So, critically, if somebody today wanted to be a true advocate of Jesus, he'd be a Jew. That's what Jesus was. If he wanted to be like Jesus, he'd be a Jew. The transitions from the beliefs of Jesus to the formation of Christian traditions created a gap of cultural misunderstandings and misinterpretations which reflect scripture to this day. There was a need to have the Hebrew scriptures translated to Greek. That having been done was called the Septuagint. According to an Eastern Orthodox scholar, 
After the Septuagint was translated in Greek from Hebrew and Aramaic, the country of Israel declared a period of mourning. Because the Greek translation was done so badly, the canonized Western Bible was influenced from this controversial translation. The, they did view the Greek translation of the Torah as being a tragedy. If you believe it to be a divine text and that every word has significance, then um, and you also assume, as, as even the rabbis did in the ancient time, that any, any translation is, is by definition an interpretation. Then by translating the text, you are, in a sense, offering a particular interpretation of that text. Well, the Septuagint was translated by the Jewish community in Egypt, where a great many of them were speaking Greek in Alexandria, rather than their native Aramaic, and they wanted to be able to read their scriptures and discuss their scriptures in Greek. The Christians were more Greek-speaking gradually, and so the Greek translation of the Old Testament became the Christian book and the Jews preferred to retain the Hebrew text. So that in a certain sense, the Jews and Christians divided between the two of them, one using the Hebrew text, the other using the Greek text. For example, the best proof text for the virgin birth of Jesus in the Old Testament uses the Greek word virgin, translating a Hebrew word which means maiden. The Septuagint seems to translate that term into a Greek word that seems to imply virgin, which Christians then use as a, as a, as a prophetic source for the virgin birth. This raises the question of 2 Timothy 3.16 which states that all scripture is divinely derived. Yeah, that's, uh, that's constantly invoked by people that say the Bible claims to be inspired. Uh, that, what, a, what a hoax this is. I mean, whoever wrote this, uh, one of the so-called Pauline writers, the pastoral author, they call him often, uh, he's certainly referring to what was considered scripture by Jews and Christians at the time, whatever that was. Not everyone agreed what constituted the Old Testament. They were still having debates at that time as to what stories should be a part of the Bible. So we don't quite know which books he had in mind, but it's more or less the Septuagint. It seems to me darn near impossible to imagine this author is thinking of the New Testament books. This is what Bible literalists claim is their authority to assert and to believe that all scripture is literally so, divinely so. The Gospels were not written when Paul made that assertion. So what scriptures could he possibly be talking about? The only scriptures that he could possibly be referring to are the Hebrew scriptures. Besides Paul's writings, the New Testament had not even been written. So how could all scripture really have been divinely inspired? My question to these people is this. Who defines what in Scripture is allegory and what is fact? Who makes that decision? Is the uh, Exodus story, is that allegory? Is the Genesis story and the Garden of Eden, is that allegory or is that a fact? And who makes these decisions? Was Jesus allegory? I mean, there's a lot of scholars that believe this man never existed. Is that allegory? Or is that a fact? Who makes that decision? Well, in the Roman Catholic Church, it you know, boils down to the Pope. He's got the last say on this. But there's 220-some Christian religions because they disagree on points like this. The Pope, early on in early Christianity, commissioned the great scholar Jerome to translate what existing scripture there was into Latin which is known as the Vulgate Bible. One of his instructions to Jerome is to figure out which of the many, many translations he had of the Gospel of Matthew should be used. There were many. Canonization is the process that determines what is written into the Bible. Canonization therefore affects the nature of various Christian religions. So few people are aware that the popular King James Version is not the only canonized Bible. There are actually four plus a variety of offshoots.
uh, the Western Church has pretty much agreed on the New Testament canon by about 400, but there was still this problem uh, that the uh, Eastern Churches didn't like Revelation and the Western ones didn't like Hebrews, and they finally ironed it out, and by 600, more or less, they were able to do the horse trade and, and get an agreement on that. The canonizing process was instead a function of an oral, illiterate church where the pastor or the bishop or somebody who knew enough to read out loud to us by the hour, um, what should that person read? Is this book good stuff to read? Or is this book going to mislead the people, create problems, doubts, and so forth. The original issue was not what stories to put into the New Testament, but what to read out loud in church. And when you see what they put in the Bible, you see they still didn't quite know. They sometimes would add a couple of books which they shouldn't have, which we don't have in the New Testament. So that there was a little fluidity as to the exact list. The Western Bible, the one we are more familiar with, was translated from Aramaic and Hebrew to Greek, to Latin, to German, to English, and so on and so on. A recent scholar, George Lamsa, decided to publish the Eastern Orthodox Bible from Aramaic, the spoken language 2,000 years ago, directly to English in order to avoid all of the translation errors. The problem was that he could not find a publisher in the United States. Eventually, he was successful. Publisher that said he would publish it with one under one condition, and what's that? It's that they add the Book of Revelation to it. So this explains why when I went through both of these Bibles, the Eastern and Western versions, word by word, and found all these differences, until Revelation, I found not a difference in the world. All she did was copy the prevailing stuff in the day. One of the many reasons the Eastern Orthodox Church opted to omit Revelation from its canonized Bible is because it depicts Jesus exactly opposite as do the Gospels. Revelation has Jesus mounted on a white horse, dressed in a white robe, dripping with blood, and with a sword in his teeth, getting ready to smite nations. Hardly the love your enemies and turn the other cheek Apologists' explanations for this are inadequate. The latest scripture, actual scripture that we have from Jews is about a thousand years old. It was in Jewish tradition that when a copyist would copy one Bible as being worn out, they would discard the old one. So we do not have a succession of evidence that would show what changes could have occurred over the years. Until the Dead Sea Scrolls, which generally date between 150 BCE and 70 CE. When somebody says that their religion is based on the canonization, they are probably not even aware that there are other canonizations that differ from their particular beliefs. So you should just remember that canonization is no astounding event, some earth-moving earth-shaking uh, procedure, it's, it's what the church says goes into the Bible at that time. And as the years change and other things changes, there are adaptations to it. The Christian Apocrypha. The Christian Apocrypha is a large variety of biblical books that never made it into canon. Even though they were not part of the Bible, they prevailed and were circulated and were believed by many Christian denominations back in the biblical days. The Gospel of Thomas was found in what's called the Nag Hammadi Library, which is 14 volumes consisting of 52 books. The Gospel of Thomas is not a narrative or stories like the other Gospels are. It is a list of 114 sayings by Jesus. You would think you'd hear more from Christians because they are all about the New Testament. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls are all about the Old Testament. <clears throat> so you'd think there'd be a lot of attention paid by Christians, but you'd almost never hear of it. And let me tell you why. <clears throat> Thomas was one of the apostles. 
and the word Thomas in Hebrew means twin. So many scholars think that the author of the Gospel of Thomas was Jesus' twin brother. Many scholars believe that it has more credibility than Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They were the kind of things that they didn't like to have read in church and therefore had no reason to copy them. The book of Thomas begins by playing on Thomas being Jesus' twin brother. You ought to know everything because you're the twin of Jesus. And think about the great saying, know thyself, quotes that. Uh, well, if you know yourself, you know Jesus because you are his twin. It's a list of 114 sayings by Jesus. And of the 114, there's two in there that are just dynamite with respect to the Christian church. And the first with respect to the Roman Catholic Church. The disciple of Jesus asked this question, when you're gone, who will succeed you? And his answer was, my brother James. We have historical documentation that James started the church in Jerusalem and then later was martyred. This is a lot different from Matthew where it says, uh, thou art Peter and on this rock, you will build my church and here's the keys, the keys of the kingdom. Um, which started the succession of the papacy. You can see why the Roman Catholic Church doesn't want to be thinking that Jesus wanted his brother to succeed him, not Peter. The part that the Catholics and the Protestants wish were not there was when they asked Jesus, Lord, when will the kingdom come? Jesus speaks frequently throughout the gospel about the kingdom. The purpose of a church is redemption. If you followed the church's suggestions, you get a chance to go to heaven. But if the kingdom is here now, what good is the church? In the gospel according to the Hebrews, Jews describe themselves as the son of the Holy Spirit. In Greek, the Holy Spirit is a feminine term. At that time, the Trinity had not been invented. Jesus, all through the Gospels, never refers to himself as the Son of God. He calls himself the Son of Man. Uh, that's, that's even more fascinating in that that seemed to mean uh, originally just human being. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not speak of Jesus as being divine. They spoke of him as the Messiah. Apologetic theologians refute this by referring to scriptures which claim Jesus is the Son of God. The Son of God was a very common expression in ancient times. Rabbis, messiahs, and even the state of Israel was referred to as the Son of God. The expression, the Son of God, in the Gospels was used very seldom. To the Christians that meant God's Son in a family sense. To a Jew, however, it did not mean that at all. To a Jew, it was an expression saying that we, like we're all sons of God. Every, everybody on the earth is a son of God. Sons of God uh, is used, and that's usually a kind of a euphemism for God's children, right, referring to uh, the Israelites primarily. What it did not mean, however, was any reference to divinity. In the Gospel of Philip, you have Jesus kissing Mary Magdalene on the lips. It says that Jesus loved her more than the other apostles. It is improbable that a single woman of biblical times would be traveling around the countryside with a group of men. It is considered very probable that as a rabbi, Jesus would have been married. in the Gospel of the Egyptians circulated between 1500 and 2000 years ago. When asked when the kingdom will come, Jesus' response was, the kingdom will come when there is no difference between male and female. The Gospel of James, where Jesus, after being resurrected, stays on earth 18 months before ascending into heaven. Another Apocryphon has Jesus on earth for 11 years, instructing his disciples in the ways of life and promising them in the 12th year, he will reveal the supreme mystery. In the Pestis Sophia, 
Sophia means wisdom. Jesus reveals himself as androgynous, a man, a savior, a female, the mother of all. One interesting apocryphon is called the Infancy Gospels. They were about Jesus when he was five years old. It speaks of Jesus getting upset with his teacher and blinding him. A playmate of his accidentally brushed him on the shoulder and Jesus kills him. The Gospel of the Infancy Gospels, of course, are trying to show that, that Jesus had supernatural powers long, even as a youngster. That's what they were there for. That is to make the whole Jesus story narrative more credible. But when you get to the canonization process, you see how important it is in view of all the Apocrypha. I mean, it could be the belief today uh, that Jesus killed his playmate at age five. If that made it into the canonization process, people would believe that today. But of course, it didn't make it, so they don't believe that. Yeah, that is uh, really still a boring after all these uh, decades. They're, they're so strange. But what I don't think anybody, is, except Elaine Pagels, began taking seriously the notion that all these strange things, the apocalypses of James, the secret books of James and John, the Melchizedek, all these strange things, weren't some kind of science fiction novels. These were actually the scriptures read in churches of Christians of a kind who didn't survive. Like St. Augustine once in a sermon said, now you uh, Christians don't go thinking Melchizedek is greater than Jesus. I know some of you do. What? We used to read this and say, well, who could he be talking about? Uh, well, suddenly uh, you find this Melchizedek document and you say, oh, these guys thought that Jesus was just the second coming of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was more important. So it's like these are like living fossils of vanished types of Christianity, stuff that must have been much further off the uh, straight path we know than the Ebionites or something. I mean, we think of these guys as eccentrics compared to historic Christianity. You've got people that believe Jesus was the an avatar of Zoroaster and all sorts of crazy stuff in the Nag Hammadi text. So I don't think people have even begun to take into account the window this opens on whole uh, continents of early Christianity that were stamped out. You have over 25,000 Christian groups for a reason. All they do is pick one text and privilege it over another. So, you know, uh, the, the, the pacifists will, will pick um, the love passages and the militarists will pick the, the Matthew 1034 passage. All biblical interpretation is actually a, a, a privileging and selecting a text. The Emperor Constantine, not only did he unite the Roman Empire, he proclaimed Christianity to be the official church of the whole empire during the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. The Council of Nicaea was a meeting that Constantine organized at his summer palace outside of Constantinople after he moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople. He came to realize that really didn't unite the empire the way it was supposed to because the Christians can't make up their mind what they believe. And so he had the bright idea of knocking the heads together. So he got all the bishops to come to his summer palace and sort of told them, Stay here until you make up your mind what the truth is. He was not a convert to Christianity. Uh, he had grown up in a kind of Christianity, the, what would become both Catholic and Orthodox once they split off. And uh, so he, which is why he was so zealous to straighten out Christianity once he recognized it and uh, gave Christian state protection, but also 
gave the state a foothold within Christianity. He said, okay, let's, let's get these debates settled now. Uh, oh boy, uh, here's my chance to have the truth prevail. And uh, so he calls the uh, Council of Nicaea and kind of lets it known which view he likes. The Nicene Creed was the effort of the Christian leaders to reach a unified statement that the emperor has assigned them to reach. Those leaders who did not agree with the creed became excommunicated heretics. He created Christianity, uh, the imperial Christianity, uh, in some ways. Constantine was responsible for mass deaths. The centers of the Council of Nicaea, those who would not adhere to his ways, were persecuted. People who objected to changing their religion from what it was to what he wanted were punished. He assassinated his own son, Crispus. He killed his own wife by having her boiled in water. He personally killed his two brothers-in-law. He suffocated an elderly monk. He was considered one of the mass murderers of his day. And yet he was responsible to a huge extent for why Christianity is the way it is today and what people still believe to this day. And of course, he was eventually sainted, Saint Constantine. But it was, it was not a theological decision on Constantine's part. It was a political move. It was a move to create harmony uh, in the empire. And to a certain extent, this was um, geographical and therefore it was quite understandable that the emperor wanted them to agree because Alexandria would think one way, Ephesus would think one way, Jerusalem would think one way, Rome would think one way. Uh, who's right? Constantine said that he did not care what the truth was. He simply wanted the Christian leaders to sign their names to one version of this story. Constantine was a Mithraist. But his mother was a Christian and the Christian faith that she belonged to became known as Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox means the right one. And that was the one Constantine was familiar with and of course was affected by his mother's counseling. So the Orthodox Roman Empire religion became his mother's version of Christianity. But I think he was just a religious zealot and, and seems to have regarded himself as the second coming of Christ. He had the relics of the uh, 12 disciples, what they thought were, gathered and, and put on a series of catafalques, I think they're called, uh, and, uh, and, and he was to be buried on one big one right in the center as if he were the second coming. And uh, he, um, you know, he, he was a religious zealot. And it, it then, of course, if you think of doing the work of a god who doesn't mind killing heretics and so on, it can't be that bad if you do it either. One thing the council did immediately was to strike out and eliminate 25 gospels of the then accepted Bible. The most important item the council ruled on was the essence of Jesus. 300 years after the time of Jesus, there was no consensus as to what really was. The debate was, was he a man, was he a god, or a combination of both? This was what was decided. I mean, that, that's why he apparently, if you read the history of Eusebius and others, uh, that's why the council was called, because Christians were disagreeing with each other about the nature of Christ, which tells you, you know, 300 years after the supposed birth of Christ, People still disagreed on who Christ was. There never was any agreement on who Christ was. Uh, uh, even in the New Testament, it, you, the author of Hebrews is still trying to argue where Jesus' place is in the hierarchy. Uh, if you read chapter 1 of Hebrews, uh, he seems to explain to his audience that Jesus is somewhere above angels and below God. You know? So if he had to explain that, it means it wasn't very clear. And that's where the Trinity got invented that Jesus was part man and part God, but he was also part of the Trinity. Uh, God the Father, God the Son, which is Jesus, and then God the Holy Spirit, or we used to call it God the Holy Ghost. But once you've got uh, the Son as well as the Father, then you can open the door to the Trinity. I, I don't think before then the Trinity had been considered a person, but for some reason it, it got thrown into the deal too, and so you have Father, Son, and Spirit.
Uh, but that's what enabled it to happen, this kind of, I think, sleight of hand trick uh, by which you can say, well, all right, they're two different persons, but they share a common nature. Uh, and uh, that uh, doesn't really work, in my humble opinion. This was one of the cutest contrivances ever bestowed on mankind. I mean, when I was in the first grade, one plus one plus one equal three. For Christianity, one plus one plus one equals one. They refined the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, how can you be both God and man and still end up as one third of God? That's complicated. This was invented in order to preserve the whole notion of monotheism, one God. So how can you have God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and have one God? Well, they just changed the definition of words and ran with it. And that's what's believed today. People believe this. It is interesting that in the 1500s, when Martin Luther proclaimed his objections to the church and separated, he began the Protestant movement which claimed to only believe Scripture. Yet they adopted the Trinity, which was conceived by the Council and is not supported by Scripture. And yet, again, this, the Trinity is a pillar of Protestant beliefs, uh, but there's nothing in Scripture to allow for that. Christianity was never really successful by just arguing. In fact, if you read Acts, you constantly see them frustrated that they're not convincing people. Uh, even Paul says, okay, the Jews aren't listening to me, now I'm going to go to the Gentiles. A number of occasions like that. So clearly he was not persuading uh, as many people as he thought. With Constantine, however, you have a new persuasion, which is the use of imperial force to unify and enforce belief. And then that tradition uh, is, is the one that sort of dominates through the medieval church. Uh, Protestantism sort of uh, fragmented it a bit, uh, and you had a bunch of religious wars as a result, the Thirty Years' War, uh, and then the effort of the Counter-Reformation. So really when you get down to it, you know, how many people have been converted by sheer uh, logic of argument or by sheer, it's usually most of Christian numbers come either because of an initial forceful action of, of forced conversion and then the the reproduction of those people of the parents who then grow uh, but it's not really uh, missionary activity is not as successful as people think even today Mistakes in the Bible can be addressed in many different ways. For example, in Exodus 4.24, there is no explanation as to what happened between the time God is talking to Moses and when he is looking to kill him. Obviously something was left out, and I would call this an honest mistake because nobody had anything to gain by not explaining what happened between the time that God is talking to Moses and when he's looking to kill him. Honest mistakes are not just in scripture. They are in actual translations or even pronunciations. The word Yahweh is a good example of that. Yahweh is God. It's the God of the Jews. Y-A-H-W-E-H. -E in the fifth century, this word was mispronounced by German Christians. Partly they were dealing an extra syllable in there, but the German scholars who decided it should be equivalent to J-A-H-W-E-H, -E of course, pronounce J's like we do Y's and W's like we do V's and some blockheads somehow didn't realize this and came up with the Yahweh business. Yahweh became Jehovah. This was an honest mistake made 1500 years ago. Scholars know this, but continue to mispronounce the word as they are accustomed to pronouncing it incorrectly. There are even religions named after this mispronunciation. Another example of honest mistakes is from the notion of original sin coming out of the Garden of Eden story. The Greek word for sin translated from Hebrew is harmatia, 
from that word comes this notion of original sin. But any linguist will tell you that the word harmatia, which is what the Bible says, the translated Bible says, does not mean sin. It does not mean sin. It means something else. It is an archery term that means to miss the mark. So Adam and Eve, if you want to get exact about this, didn't sin like the Christian church claimed they sin. They didn't get it. They misunderstood. They went down the wrong path or what have you, but no way in the world does this mean sin. That's, I'm glad you brought that up, but that's, that's yet another wrinkle in the thing because historically Judaism didn't take the Adam and Eve story to be the origin of sin. It was the origin of death. In 1505, Michelangelo sculpted a statue of Moses and put horns on his head. That was the origin of many similar depictions seen today. The Catholic translation of the Jewish Bible's word for radiant appearance was wrongly mistranslated to horns. Christianity references Isaiah 714 as the coming of Jesus Christ. Quote, a virgin will conceive a son, unquote. The Jewish Bible does not use virgin, it uses maiden. A maiden will conceive a son. Why would the Septuagint translators have picked that word to translate? I mean, Matthew's just quoting the Septuagint. They couldn't have thought it meant pre-sexual virgin. It must have just come to be a synonym already by that time. So that creates a problem that we don't know for sure whether Matthew even means Jesus was born of a virgin. There are other ways of reading the passage. The problem, of course, is, um, is that the Masoretic text does not use the word virgin. If they wanted to say virgin, there is a word and that means exactly that. But this word means young lady or a maiden. This is known to scholars, they know this, and yet it's continued in the belief of certain Christian religions of, of today. The Jews refer to their holy scriptures as a history to their religion, despite Christians deliberately separating themselves from Judaism. They maintain their versions of the Old Testament because of the prophecies they claim it has for the advent of Jesus. Christianity has uh, reintroduced the sun, which the Hebrew religion sort of took out um, in some ways. And now you had a father and a son. When Catholicism developed, they put the mother back in. So, so it's Mary represents the mother that was there in the pantheons of the ancient Near East. So that functionally, she's how should I put it, as useful as Isis is, or Minerva, or Athena, or these deities. In other words, once you can't be polytheistic any longer, you've got to provide for the population that grew up in polytheism some equivalence. And that's what the angels and the demons and the saints and Mary and those kind of figures in Christianity, you know, the same thing happened with the places. If you've got a place where there was a pagan shrine and the Christians take over, what you do is to get rid of the paganness of the shrine, build a church there, consecrate it, and now the same people that went to that same hilltop to worship a pagan religion go there to worship Christianity. So many a church has underneath it a pagan shrine. I'm a little surprised they did it, actually. You, you'd think that the early Christians would have thought these places irredeemably polluted by paganism, but uh, apparently not. Apparently, uppermost was the idea that this is a way of uh, getting people to just come into Christianity without missing a beat. There's nothing in scripture that says suicide is a bad thing. 
There's a half dozen examples in the Old Testament of suicide, and there's one glaring example in the New Testament of suicide, and never will you find any of these suicides criticized. Christianity promised heaven if you behaved yourself. Heaven was wonderful and just couldn't get any better. They talk of people going to their rewards if you do what God instructed. A few hundred years after the time of Christ, those at the bottom of society, slaves, women, and the poor, were committing suicide to get their rewards. They would jump off cliffs, they would drown themselves in the river, or they would fall on a sword, they'd take poison, and they were killing themselves to such a degree that it was Augustine, around 400 AD, that just proclaimed that suicide is henceforth a cardinal sin. Anyone committing a cardinal sin will not go to heaven. At the time of the Reformation, there were protesters who became Protestants, protested against some of the practices of the Catholic Church and broke away. Suicide was not an issue. Protestants claimed at the time, and some still do, that they believe nothing that isn't in, in Scripture. And that's not in Scripture, but they, they missed that one. This subject is interesting in modern times, as there are now laws in individual states regarding suicide. These laws are supported by those who believe that suicide is a mortal sin. Yes, suicide is not uh, in, endorsed directly uh, in the New Testament, but there uh, indirect ways that I, I think uh, uh, are just as bad. It, martyr is what. So you can't kill yourself, but it was great to be a martyr. Uh, uh, so uh, in fact, Tertullian said, you know, Christian is built on the blood of martyrs. So the more of us you kill, the more we grow. Well, that's kind of encouraging martyrdom. So if, if that's what you mean by suicide, that's one thing. There is another passage where Paul says, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. Uh, and you, you'll see a spirit-centered or pneumatocentric ideology on 9-11. When Mohammed Atta flung himself into those towers, he could care less about his body. He wasn't there for his body. What he wanted was to get his soul into paradise. His soul was more important. Now that does have some precedent in the New Testament. Uh, if you read Matthew 10, 28. Jesus himself says, do not worry about those that can kill the body. Worry about those that can kill the soul. Apparently for Jesus, it is more important for the soul to be saved than the body. And, and so, so in many ways, religion can devalue life. Abortion fits into the same category as it was common in biblical times. In the year 1140, the Pope declared that abortion was acceptable, but only under certain conditions. This was the law in the Catholic Church until 1917. The question was, at what moment does the soul enter the fetus? The answer to that question determined the abortion regulations by the church. One big reason for the growth of Christianity was that they were against abortion and its twin practice infanticide, which is real common. Uh, what, another girl, toss her out with the garbage tomorrow. Uh, well, the Christians didn't do this uh, for whatever reason, uh, and uh, they, they kept them. Yeah, they had more mouths to feed, but it also meant they had more girls to marry off to pagans, which they did, and the guys would then get converted. And so one of the big reasons Christianity grew was that they, would, that they, they kept the, the girls alive and had missionary marriage. Abortion was permitted up to 40 days after conception under certain circumstances. The belief in resurrection was a common belief in biblical days. Uh, you'll remember that passage where Herod wonders if Jesus was the 
reincarnation of John the Baptist. Well, he didn't know any better, but those two were cousins and lived at the same time, so that could hardly be so. But the point is that it was common in those days, uh, in many religions, of the notion of resurrection, and in many, many other beliefs, uh, different cultures, in those days about the whole notion of reincarnation as it is prevalent quite a bit today. And, and that also appears in Judaism, but a bit later. And it may, also, it may already be in there in the Gospel of John, where in chapter 9 they see this blind beggar. Everybody knows he was born blind, and they ask Jesus, tell me, uh, was this guy born blind because of his own sins or those of his parents? That really has to mean reincarnation has crept in via Hellenism there. The talk is frowned upon by the churches because of such notions outside of the story about Jesus would detract from the uniqueness of the resurrection. Celibacy in itself is an interesting concept. There's nothing in scripture that provides for celibacy, nothing. Celibacy has a very complicated history. Uh, but no, celibacy as a church doctrine probably developed after the Council of Nicaea for the most part. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, exalted celibacy. You didn't have to be celibate, but that was the, uh, the, the elite way to go. And Josephus says it was because they wanted to just keep their minds on God the whole time. Priests were permitted to be married up to 1139 AD until the church decided to enforce celibacy at the Second Lateran Council. Many Christians and almost all Catholics pray to the Virgin Mary. This is a huge importance to the faith. The Virgin Mary was not considered deified. She was an important woman, but not God or divine. If Jesus even performs the same function as a holy child because he's God incarnate, automatically his mother's going to be uh, lifted up to match it. But I do think, in fact, that uh, the whole package comes from pre-Christian religions, that the, uh, just as Is Osiris, who died and rose and begat Horus and then went on to rule the netherworld, and you got Isis with, with baby Horus, who is Osiris reincarnated, that's pretty much like Mary and Jesus. You can't even tell the difference with the statues. It wasn't until 1854 when the church officially decided that Mary was born of immaculate conception. The kingdom is the most important meaning Christians changed from Jewish belief, using the same words. All through the gospel, Jesus constantly talks about the kingdom. You gotta do this to get into the kingdom. You have to do that. And, and this is what needs to be done. And that's what needs to be done in order for the kingdom to come. And then Twice in the Gospels, the apostles ask, you know, when is the kingdom coming? Uh, one time he says, there are some amongst you here that will not taste death before the kingdom arrives. In other words, it's imminent. And that was 2,000 years ago, and it still hasn't come. The kingdom to a Jew 2,000 years ago was very specific. It meant the condition of Israel, and hopefully the rest of the world, when the Jews went back to the Torah and the prophets. This is what Jesus must have meant because he lived in that culture where the meaning was clear. I have not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. Jesus was a reformer. When the country reformed and went back to the ways and the will of God, that's when the kingdom would then exist. This would happen on earth. And what the Christians did is took that word and changed it into heaven. There's no way in the world that's what was meant when the Gospels were read. Well, by kingdom, they just mean God's regime, God's system of laws. Nobody's forcing you to keep them. But if you do, you're saying, yeah, I'm keeping the, the laws of the king of kings. The current Christian's belief of the kingdom is a place where you go to as a reward after death. It simply did not mean that at the time of Jesus when he spoke of it. This is why, both in the Gospels, the way they are now, and in the Gospel of Thomas, which never made it into canon, they, they say, when is this kingdom going to come? 
and depending on which one you read, it's it's imminent. It's just about here. But when it happens, it's going to be here on Earth, not in heaven. There are a number of cultural misunderstandings in Scripture. And that's a matter of Scripture being translated from one language and its culture into another language and its culture. And there are real problems in that. This is where so many of the mistakes occur in Scripture. These mistakes are part of the Bible, and these mistakes are believed. For example, Jesus said, that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. The city of Jerusalem had a great wall around it for protection. The wall contained several gates which people passed through, but at night they closed them because of the night marauders. They closed all but one, which they only lifted up halfway at night. And the reason for that was the night caravans who came in is kept marauders out who are, you know, trying to gallop in on horse or, or camelback. But the, the honest uh, caravan couldn't be left outside. They had to be able to get inside. So they had this gate only halfway up. And the only way the camels could get through that was to get down on their knees and crawl through. They could do this. The camel can do this. The name of that gate was the Eye of the Needle. When Jesus stated that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to go to heaven, he meant that for a rich man to go to heaven, he must lower or humble himself. So you guys out there that are women that are making a lot of money, relax, you can still go to heaven and be a good Christian. Another cultural misunderstanding came from the early days of Christianity, from the story of the Eucharist. The Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper, is a commemoration of the Last Supper, the final meal that Jesus Christ shared with his apostles before his arrest and eventual crucifixion. Jesus said to his apostles, Eat this bread, it is my body, and drink this wine, it is my blood. There are several things that can be readily deduced from this story such as it could not have been written by a Jew. And the reason for that is the dietary laws of the Jews were absolutely sacred. The thought of drinking blood or drinking something symbolically of blood is the last thing in the world that any Jew would ever do, and they were all Jews that were there. There's no way that a Jew could have written that. This is an attempt to Judaize in terms of slightly later Judaism, something that is just pagan. Uh, it's absolutely clear. I mean, you tell me what this has to do with, with anything in Passover. Uh, in, in the book of Leviticus, the idea of drinking blood is such a loathsome, abominable notion, right up there with child molesting or having sex with animals. Like, there is no way that any uh, Jewish writer would, would use this as a religious ritual. But you look over in the Osiris religion, they already had a sacrament where uh, you would drink beer and eat bread because Osiris was the god of grain. He rises, it's the ever-renewing nature thing. His body is the bread, his blood is the beer. What does Jesus say in the, the Last Supper? This bread is my body, this wine is my blood. He's Dionysus, he's, uh, he's Osiris. It, it's the whole notion that his blood is wine. Come on, what does this mean? He, he's the god of the grain and, and the, the wine and the grape and all of that. That's probably not uh, something uh, Orthodox Judaism would endorse. Uh, uh, it, it, now that part can all actually be kind of a part of a mystery religion. Now that part can be. Uh, because eating of a god, uh, technically known as theophagy, uh, might have been part of what uh, some Near Eastern religions were about. You know. 
uh, we know that um, Mithras also had uh, sacred uh, bread and water, and some of the early Christians, many of them had that because they were teetotalers for other reasons. But the, uh, the Gospels have bread and wine, and that just has to come from mystery religions. If Jesus had said such a thing, uh, this just, that would just be so revolting to Jews. And we even have an earlier version of it in the Didache, a late 1st, early 2nd century Syrian uh, church manual where it says, it even uses the word Eucharist, there is nothing about either the death of Jesus or the body and blood of Jesus. So we know there were versions of the Eucharist that didn't have all this gory stuff. That comes from, uh, from these, uh, the mystery religions. Another cultural misunderstanding probably happened shortly after the death of Jesus when the Bible was written. Matthew and Mark claimed Jesus' last words were, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These words make no sense in context that we're familiar with in Scripture. But the Eastern Orthodox Bible has the translation of that, supposedly, which makes nothing but sense. Their words are, My God, my God, for this I have been spared. Now, that makes no sense unless you know Jewish tradition. Jewish tradition said that the Messiah would be martyred and raised from the dead. Jesus was convinced that he was the Messiah and thought that if he was crucified, that he would be raised from the dead. So when he says it in the Eastern Orthodox Bible, My God, my God, for this I have been spared. It makes perfect sense. You're right. It would make no sense if he was uh, a, a divine sort of messiah. It, it seems to be more of a cry for an explanation. Uh, he is experiencing something he did not expect to experience, and that being for, forsaken by God. So that would fit into the idea Jesus um, didn't see himself as divine. He saw himself as a man. And he's trying to explain to himself uh, why. Now, of course, the, the issue is we don't know what, what he said. <laughs> you know, we, we cannot verify. There is no videotape to know what he said uh, on the cross or anywhere else. You must look into the ideology of why an author would have Jesus say something like that. One reason would be to fulfill scripture. It was very important to fulfill tradition, especially to the gospel writers. And uh, so uh, Mark just pillaged Psalm 22 to flesh out the basic idea of the crucifixion, which he never would have done had anybody been on hand to pass down an account of it. This is one of the things that really got me first thinking, was there a Jesus to try to tell the story of the crucifixion, the single most important story? and they have to go to one of the Psalms and rewrite it? I mean, <laughs> don't tell me that there were people present at this central event and all memory of it vanished. Because the other gospels just add a few more Bible verses to Mark. It's just astounding. Satan. Satan appears only a few times in the Old Testament. The first time is in Chronicles when Satan is trying to get King David to take a census. In Psalm 109, King David is complaining about people who are plotting against him, and Satan is there too to lend assistance. In Zechariah, he assists Joshua, the high priest. Again, all of these three things are extremely unimportant. Satan is a very minor figure. Where he gets his prominence is in the book of Job. He's not the serpent. There's no connection there with Eden. Satan has nothing to do with that story. Uh, but the, the Satan appears these three times in, in the Old Testament, at least. But he's always God's prosecutor. It's like in Job, but it's implicit in all of them. Uh, God says, hey, how do you like my boy down there, Job? And the Satan says, come on, don't be a fool. This, you look at the stuff you do for this guy. He'd be a fool if he didn't worship you. Why don't you find out where his loyalties really are? Take away all these goodies. He'll be cursing you in five minutes. 
Uh, all right, let's try it. Uh, and eventually it turns out God is right. Uh, Job was sincere. But, but Satan was just trying to protect God's image. Same thing with Joshua the high priest and Zechariah. Same thing with David. Because Satan actually, if you read Job, was probably a good guy there. Uh, in Job 1.6, uh, it says that one day the sons of God, and here we go back to I think there's polytheism in the Bible. It's just people don't recognize it. So in Job, I think you have a polytheistic God. Uh, and he has sons, they're gods, and one of them is Satan. What Satan does is apparently he goes around the earth doing reconnaissance and watching out for people that might not be um, worshiping God. Uh, I might not be honest about it. So he devises this plan. He's actually looking out for God. This, all this nastiness was not done by Satan. This was done by God in Satan's challenge. And this is where Satan gets his reputation of being known in, at all, because the other three incidents are just so minor. How did Satan become a bad guy in Christianity? What happened is in the depiction of God before the time of Jesus, God was depicted by Jews as, yes, a loving and just God. But when he wanted to be, he could be wrathful. He could be vengeful. He could be jealous. You know, with the time of Noah, he wiped out every soul on earth, except for eight people, because he was mad at people. I mean, this is a guy that's capable of some very, very wicked, nasty things. But along comes Jesus, and along comes the change and the depiction of how do we depict God? What was God? What is God like? And of course, they came up with uh, charity, love, and compassion. This is the new way of looking at God. And in there is created one of the biggest problems in Christianity is if God is so loving and so compassionate, what's all this evil doing? So the church had to come up with an answer for that. And their answer was, Satan did it. Because Satan was originally a rather neutral figure in the heavenly court who only gradually took on the role of the bad guy to relieve the good God of bad things. All of the bad things were pushed off onto Satan to whatever extent they couldn't be blamed on Adam and Eve. When uh, the Jewish priests and aristocrats were carried off to house arrest in Babylon uh, in uh, Jeremiah's time, 6th century BCE, eventually, before they left, uh, 50 years later, the empire was taken over by the Persians, Cyrus the Great and so on, and they were Zoroastrians. The Babylonians were just polytheists, as the Jews had been, actually, uh, until the, e the very eve when, uh, of the exile, when they started thinking maybe Yahweh is the only God. But once they thought that, and they meet up with the Zoroastrians, they say, hey, this sounds pretty good. They've got a, a, a high god who is moral, a Hura Mazda, but there's also this guy, the anti-god, Ahriman, whose very existence explains where evil comes from. That's a problem with us. And so they decided, well, you suppose the Satan could be the origin of evil? Now, it turns out that in all the pantheons, uh, of the ancient Near East, there was always a god, a son of a god, who was always rebellious somehow, or wanted to dethrone the, the, the father. So you, you have that in Greek mythology with, with Cronus. Uh, you have it in uh, the Enuma Elish in Mesopotamia, where uh, the younger gods fight against Tiamat, uh, and that god is Marduk. So in all the pantheons, you always have this disobedient son, this disobedient usurper. You go to Revelation 20, and then Satan is equated with a dragon there. Uh, and the dragon, um, we even have pictures of that dragon with seven heads, all the way back to the second millennium BC. You know, even though he's mentioned in Revelation, we have that seven-headed dragon it must be a continuous motif uh, throughout the first, second millennium BC or right. So you're seeing glimpses of this rebellious figure, this chaos figure, uh, that then 
becomes in later Christian mythology, Christian theology by medieval times as, you know, Satan. The word Lucifer means the bearer of light. Isaiah calls him the son of the morning. This is the same thing. The notion that a fallen angel has some authority or power to thwart God is not supported in scripture. It is simply a Christian assertion. Satan was a fallen angel and he was the guy that created evil and somehow he was able to thwart God's will. Well, how does this hang? How does this hold up? How has this been sustained all these years? God in every religion that there is that I ever heard of could do anything. He's the creator of everything. So he's the creator of evil. And if he's a loving and compassionate God, why in the name of anything would he create evil? This makes no sense. The Dead Sea Scrolls consist of roughly 900 documents, including texts from the Hebrew Bible. They were discovered between 1947 and 1956 in 11 caves located on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. The texts are of great religious and historical significance as they include some of the only known surviving copies of biblical documents written before 100 BCE and preserve evidence of considerable diversity of belief and practice within the late Second Temple Judaism. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a very important discovery, perhaps most important by having produced Hebrew copies of Old Testament books. What most people don't know is that our oldest copies of the Hebrew Bible are medieval. And so the Dead Sea Scrolls all of a sudden produced copies that were a thousand years older than the oldest copy. The Dead Sea Scrolls eliminate the notion of Bible literalism. Now let me explain. The book of Genesis has, we have Dead Sea Scrolls of 20 different versions of that, and they, they're all different. An incidental example in Samuel is when David slew Goliath with a sling. Goliath, the giant, was six cubits, one span tall. The Hebrew cubit is about 18 inches. The span, about six inches. That makes Goliath nine feet, six inches tall. One of the Genesis translations has Goliath four cubits, one span in height. That would make him six foot, six inches. And to the average Jew of about five foot three or four in those days, this was indeed a, a giant which is absolutely unimportant until you get to literacy. Which version was true? Was he nine feet or was he six feet? Uh, yeah, we, we knew already that uh, there had to be different manuscript traditions in the Old Testament based on uh, different sources used, uh, like the Samaritan Pentateuch had different readings than either the Septuagint or the Masoretic text, which is the medieval one, and uh, who knows where they branched off, but apparently there was some editing done early on that changed some readings, and they, they're passed down in these three great streams. All of them attested again in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They have features of all three of them, the Samaritan, the Septuagint, and the Masoretic. What the Dead Sea Scrolls have done is to show us the diversity. That there was no one view of almost anything. Uh, Messiah, you know, or the law, uh, the canon. There were just different groups, just like there are today. And if you look at the world today, you have, you know, 25,000 different Christian groups. They don't real. They don't seem to accept that in the earlier days, when these all the Old Testament books were composed, there was heavy editing and rewriting and interpolating. The text of the Bible was not fixed, uh, even at that time. So in other words, the fact that you had so many different textual variants means that it was the Bible. The text of the Bible was fluid. All the words were not the same for all groups and throughout history. So the Bible you have today is quite different from, say, certain versions of the Bible that were around uh, are represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, uh, Jeremiah, probably there was a version that was one-eighth shorter than what we have. Uh, it's also represented in 
the Greek scriptures. But it, the Dead Sea Scrolls only confirm the diversity of textual traditions that were available. And what modern Christians have done is pick one of those traditions and privileged it. But it doesn't mean they have to be the one. Some of them are dramatically different. So if somebody says today that my canonized Bible, I believe everything in there that is literally true, I wonder which of those variations they're talking about. And do they know? Of course not. In the book of Exodus, there are a dozen different translations with different versions of the story. So the idea that everything in the canonized Bible is divinely inspired can't be true. It cannot be true. The Bible is full of conflicts, such as doublets. Let's talk about doublets. A doublet is two versions of the same event whereby one could be right, and if it is, the other one has to be wrong, and vice versa. The, the Bible is full of these things. Some of the obvious ones are in the story of Noah and his ark. It states that on board came two of each species, a male and a female. So you ask any Christian how many of each species, how many, uh, went on the ark, they'll tell you two. However, about five lines later, it says seven of each species went on the ark. And it had certain provisions in there. But if one is right, the other has to be wrong. You'll find a lot of double talk coming out of theologians on how to get around these things. But the reading is quite clear. A very, very important a doublet in the New Testament, I'm just going to touch on a, a few of these, is the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew 1.1, the New Testament, starts with the genealogy of Jesus. In Matthew, it starts with Abraham, and Abraham begot Isaac, and on and on, all the way up until the time of Jesus. Luke has a version in his third chapter of the genealogy of Jesus, which it goes backwards. It starts with Jesus and goes all the way back to Adam. And the reason for it being prominent in the New Testament, the reason it starts that way, is one of the expectations of the Messiah when he comes had to come from one single tribe of the 12 tribes, and that's the tribe of Judah, which was the tribe of King David, David in Jewish tradition is the most macho Jew in history. One of the requirements to recognize the Messiah whenever he came was that he was from that particular tribe. Now the problem with this is two problems. The problem is if you turn uh, one of them upside down so they both go through the same procedure in the same chronology as opposed to one starting with Abraham coming up to Jesus, the other one starting with Jesus going back to Adam is that there's maybe a 10% match in there at most. That's a doublet. Two accounts of the same thing. I mean, they don't even agree on the name of Jesus' grandfather. Genealogies differ because they're instruments of power. Uh, and so they're there to legitimize um, Jesus' claim to the throne, the Messianic throne. So in Matthew, if you notice, does not have the same number of of generations than Luke and Matthew has 42 generations exactly it says between Abraham and Jesus but Luke has over 50 so obviously both numbers cannot be right either there are 42 generations between Abraham and Jesus or there are not and the names uh, also differ and the second problem with all that is that uh, Jesus's father was not Joseph at all it was the Holy Spirit so how do you justify Jesus coming from the tribe of Judah if his father was the Holy Ghost? So uh, since they did not have DNA, there's no way that Luke or Matthew could have verified the genealogies anyway. So genealogies are there simply to legitimize Jesus' claim uh, to, to, to power, at least from the viewpoint of Matthew and Luke. When was Jesus born? Our whole calendar is based on Jesus' birthday. That's a doublet because in Matthew, he had to be born no later than 4 BC. And the reason for that is in the nativity story of, of Matthew, um, Herod the king 
is afraid that Jesus is going to take his job, grow up and take his job. So he orders the death of all a two-year-old and less, and, and under that, males. But we know historically that Herod died in 4 BC. We have all kinds of confirmation of that. And uh, so if he commanded the massacre of the babies, which is a huge if, I mean, assuming this happened, because the same thing happens in all kinds of hero birth stories, assuming this one really happened, well, he must have done it before he was dead. Uh, and so you get the two-year variance because uh, he asked the wise men when they saw Jesus' natal star, and it was two years before. So uh, Jesus must have been born at least two years before Herod croaked. We don't know how many more years it might have been, so that that's even more ambiguous. Luke has Mary and Joseph going to Jerusalem in order to register for the census. We know historically that the census could not have been any earlier than 6 AD. We know when these censuses were. They took one every 14 years, and the first one they took that, and that was it. So according to Luke, Jesus was born 6, maybe 7 AD. So you've got a 10 year discrepancy there. You've got a double. One says one thing, the other about this, about something, and the other says something else about that. And they can't both be right. Uh, it's possible they're both wrong. It's even worse than that because there were Jewish and Jewish Christian sources that say Jesus was crucified under Alexander Janias uh, in about 182 BCE. Uh, so what's the deal there? Uh, uh, it seems like it's supposed to be the same guy. Uh, and Irenaeus tells us that Jesus was crucified under Claudius Caesar once he had reached the age of 49. If Jesus was a historical figure, how come nobody could get these basic things straight? Who carried the cross when Jesus was setting off to be crucified? Well, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, it's Simon of Cyrene. According to John, it's Jesus. So the stuff you see on television of Jesus struggling with the cross and falling down, and there's absolutely nothing in scripture about falling down any place. Um, on the Via de la Rosa in Jerusalem, they, they've got points marked off where Jesus fell down in his struggles to and carrying the cross, well, this is Catholic tradition. There's nothing in scripture that says this. There's nothing in dogma that says this. It's just something they choose to believe. But this is another doublet. I mean, who carried the thing? Was it Simon or was it Jesus himself? Another doublet is in the sixth commandment, at least in the Protestant version. Thou shalt not kill. Truly it says, thou shalt not murder, as in the original translation. And yet when God sends Joshua into Jericho, his orders are to kill everyone in sight, every man, every woman, every child, every animal. This contradicts, thou shalt not murder. Jesus, according to Matthew, gave the Sermon on the Mount. If you had to use one part of the New Testament, which depicts Jesus better than anything else, most people would say it's the Sermon on the Mount but Luke describes the same sermon in a plane. Now, how can witnesses be confused if he's standing on a mountainside or he's standing on a flat piece of earth? How does a Bible literalist contend with this? Well, the answer is this, they don't. They say God works in mysterious ways and I'm not gonna question this. Next subject, please. Another doublet is God good, or is he good and or evil? Psalm 145 says, the Lord is good to all. And yet Isaiah 445 says, I make peace and create evil. There are dozens and dozens of similar doublets. There are also triplets in the Bible, which are three different versions of the same events. The Ascension story, Jesus is crucified, he dies, he's raised from the dead, he works with his apostles and then rises into heaven. Each of the Gospels has got a different story. Well, uh, Luke appears to have an ascension story, but the majority text, or the manuscripts we've got, say that Jesus was parted from them, and they went on back into Jerusalem rejoicing, 
the so-called Western family of manuscripts say he was parted from them and carried up to heaven, and they went back rejoicing. But then Acts, which seems to be written by the same person, has Jesus hang on, hanging around for 40 days and then ascending, and it's very explicit he's taken up into the sky. But the most important one in my mind are Jesus' last words on earth. Uh, he's been up on that cross. He's dying. He knows he's dying. And there are three different versions of his last words before he expires. Matthew and Mark say this. His last words are, Eli, Eli, why hast thou forsaken me? And he dies. This has been trouble to Christian theologians for 1,700 years now. What does he mean by this? What is, he, is he renouncing God? Is he challenging God? Is he disappointed by God? His word is forsaken. Why hast thou forsaken me? It just doesn't fit. And yet uh, along comes Luke. Now, Luke doesn't say that at all. What Luke says his last words are, when Jesus knows he's about to expire, he says, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And you'll find that this one is used more often than the others because it suits the situation better and doesn't create all these problems. And John, you know, just says something totally different. His last words are, it is finished. In other words, it's all over now. It is finished. And then that's his last breath. He dies. So these are triplets. No way can more than one of these triplets be right. It's possible that they're all wrong, but there's no way that one can be right. And if one is right, any one the other two have to be wrong. Uh, in the New Testament, it's just the growth of stories. I mean, um, even today, uh, variant stories grow from the beginning. You take a look at any news event, and you'll have a hundred different newspapers, and you already are having different versions of things. So, so variation is inherent in any event. From the beginning, it's there. Joseph Campbell said that one of the problems with Christianity is that it uses 2,000-year-old science, and we look at it today through today's science. This is a problem. A good example of that is Noah's flood. The Bible says that God caused it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. It says the waters rose to cover all of the mountains on the planet. It says the waters stayed there for 150 days and slowly receded. Two things. If there had been a flood like that, any sophomore geology student could go out and find it in about an hour. And a zillion people have looked for evidence of that flood, and there is none. It does not exist. The, as I understand it, the biblical flood would have been somewhere between 6,000 and 9,000 years ago, depending on which authority you listen to. Unfortunately, there is very good uh, records of the rise in sea level over the last 18,000 years. And when we look at the sea level curves and all the studies done, none of them show that sea level was ever more than maybe a meter or five, four or five feet above present sea level. Okay, if all the ice, all the polar ice were to melt tomorrow, sea level would come up to about the, neck of the Statue of Liberty. But we also know that if instead of raining for 40 days and 40 nights, if every single ounce of water vapor was taken out of the air and landed on the planet Earth, it would raise the ocean one inch. And yet the Bible says it covered the mountain tips, uh, Mount uh, Ararat there at 17,000 feet high, uh, Everest, which is on the other side of the Earth, and they probably didn't know about it, which is another 10,000 feet. But it says the water covered these things and stayed up there. Where did that water come from? And once it was there, where did it go to? 
we don't know, but the, the description of the Bible is absolute nonsense. It's an absurdity. But the whole thing is a tissue of, uh, of sad ignorance. It's very imaginative, but the storytellers had no idea what would be entailed. I, with this, it was just uh, uh, one of many ancient flood stories. It probably came from garbled memories of devastating local floods all over the place. I mean, we know there were plenty of floods. The geological core shows that. What it does not show is the world flood. Uh, that, that's the problem with it. Back in the mid-1800s, the good Bishop Usher of Ireland added up all of the begattens. This guy begat that, and he lived so many years, and then that, he, he begat somebody else, and you know he sired somebody else, and they gave the number of years it's all for, and came up with the conclusion that the world is 6,000 years old. That is from the Big Bang, or God's creation of the world, until today, it's 6,000 years old. And I want to tell you something. There's Bible literalists that just believe this. This is an absurdity. Scientists date the age of the Earth at 4.54 billion years old, with a margin of error at 1%. Moses is one of the pillars of Judaism. I've made talks where I describe Moses as the world's worst navigator. It took him 40 years to get to Jericho, and it's an 11-day walk from Cairo. He's got to be a bad navigator. The world's the strangest author because he is the only author ever known in the history of the planet who wrote about his own death and some uh, happenings thereafter. Uh, had the world's worst memory because there he is coming down from the mountain with these two tablets in his hands and one of them says, one of the things says, thou shalt not murder and he orders the death of 3,000 people that are cutting up down there while he's got it in his hand. That's a very short memory. One of the commandments Moses presented says to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. However, the penalty for working on the Sabbath is severe. Leviticus 2330. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. When I was in Sunday school, we were taught that the Gospels were written and written by witnesses to the fact. People saw and they wrote down what they saw. Well, there's problems with this. One problem is, to pick just one, is when Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness warding off the devil's temptations, it was just Jesus and the devil. Who recorded that? Did Satan record that? Did Jesus record that? I don't think so. At the beginning of the Gospel of John, when Jesus is approaching John the Baptist, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, and then baptizes Jesus. Well, there's a couple of problems with this. That was 2,000 years ago, and the sins of the world are still with us. The other problem is, why would, in the Gospel of John, which starts as Jesus being God, why would a God need baptism? I mean, the purpose of baptism is to eliminate sin from a person. Uh, how could a God have sin? In the Exodus story, the Jews are going to flee Egypt. The Bible says there are 600,000 men that fled Pharaoh under the leadership of Moses. With those 600,000 men, you also have an equal amount of women, plus their kids, the elderly, and their animals. According to the scripture, there are more Jews than Egyptians at that time. They fled Pharaoh, crossed the Red Sea, and they got away just before the Pharaoh's chariot caught up with them to wipe them out. This is highly unlikely. How fast can an estimated two and a half million people travel with all of their family members, their belongings, their animals, and herds, and dogs, and cats, and sheep, and cattle, and such? 
They couldn't have moved over a half a mile an hour, and yet the Pharaoh's chariots couldn't catch them. And this is, uh, this is not believable. I, I don't believe it's, it's historical. Um, I, I, I think basically what you have seen in the last uh, 100, 150 years is a continued shrinkage and diminution in what is called historical. So if you were talking to uh, most biblical scholars in the year 1900, most of them probably would say, well, a lot of Genesis and Exodus uh, is probably historical. Uh, you know, by the time you get to the 21st century, uh, most of the patriarchal stories are probably not held as, as fully historical. The Exodus stories are not held as fully historical. And it, there's been a, a continuous shrinkage in what we call historical. And even for Jesus, you know, the, the amount of things we could say are historical has shrunk so that you only have a few things that people can agree on as historical. And even uh, that uh, is questionable too. Why have Jews been persecuted and slaughtered for the past 2,000 years? And it comes from the notion that Jews killed the Messiah. Jews killed our Savior. So let's take a look at that. I suspect that may be all wrong. First of all, the Jews did not kill Jesus. The Romans killed Jesus. Jews did not have the authority to crucify anybody in their history. The crucifixion was a Roman method of execution. And to think historically that Pontius Pilate would have been swayed by Sanhedrin or other Jews is simply not in accordance with what we know about the historical Pilate. But let's look at this from a little different angle. Back around the time when Jesus was being born, there was a man called Judas of Galilee. Judas the Galilean was a first century rabbi who some proclaimed was the Messiah. Judas was a revolutionary who refused to pay taxes to Caesar. He raised an army and fought the Romans. And they caught him and they cut his head off. And they crucified, depending on which version you read, somewhere around two to three thousand of his followers crucified them. So, the Sanhedrin in the Gospel, at the time of Jesus, were old enough to remember this massacre. Was it possible that Jesus was crucified not only to satisfy Pontius Pilate, but to save Jesus' followers from slaughter? Could one man's death prevent what happened a generation before, where thousands were killed who followed another supposed Messiah? Like nobody would ever condemn a general for sending 10 men to their certain death in order to save a thousand men. Might this be why Jesus' death occurred the way it did? Maybe they did it because that might satisfy Pilate, one man's death, to get rid of the so-called troublemaker, in order to not do what they did a generation before to another self king uh, Messiah and kill a few thousand Jews. Maybe all this persecution and slaughter of the Jews was just a total misinterpretation of what the Gospel says. The whole message of Christianity is that God, in order to save mankind, sent His only Son down to be killed and die a horrible death. That was God's method of saving mankind from sin. Why would God do that? Why couldn't he just toss down some thunderbolts and clean up the situation some other way? There is a hypothetical answer we would like to present. If you recall the story of Abraham, poised with a knife, about to cut the throat of his only son, Isaac, when an angel appeared and held his hand back. Some scholars think that this was an attempt to end the whole notion of child sacrifice. Uh, child sacrifice being the greatest benevolence somebody could could show his deity by killing his most precious possession, which is his firstborn son. Child sacrifice was fairly common in the Mediterranean area in biblical days, because giving up to God the most important thing a person owns is his firstborn son. That was the height of reverence. 
It's possible that the story of God sending down his firstborn son as a sacrifice may have originated through other cultures with similar beliefs from that time. So maybe that's where this story comes from, of God sending his only son down to be killed. Maybe that is a result of what happened in other cultures around the area at that time. How could it be that the birth of Jesus, such a spectacular thing, was not in Mark or John? The Gospels were an account of the ministries of Jesus, so a virgin birth would be extremely important. And this was an incredibly remarkable event. How come it's not in there? It may not have been included in Mark because it simply hadn't been thought of yet. Uh, later, you know, maybe 15 years or so later, it was in Matthew and it was in Luke. And again, the stories differed quite a bit, but they, at least they were in there. And they included the story because it very much embellished the magnificence of Jesus. And then some years later uh, was the Gospel of John and it's not in there. Why? I mean, how can such a spectacular thing be absent from an accounting of Jesus? Again, for a completely different reason. And that is that the Gospel of John starts with Jesus is God, and a spectacular birth would be unnecessary. In summary, my thinking is that it was not in Mark because it hadn't been thought of yet. And then later came Luke and, and Matthew, and they put it in there because it very, very much embellished the magnificence of Jesus. But then later, with the Gospel of John, it was not in there again, but for a totally different reason, and that is because the Gospel of John starts with Jesus is God. Now, none of the other three Gospels even suggest that. But that's why it's, uh, that's why it's not needed in John. It's just necessary for a God to have a spectacular birth or any kind of birth. It's, as esteemed as you can get to start with. There is no question that Christianity, like many other belief systems, has been modified from its original intent and original beliefs. The first Christians were Jews who did not believe that Jesus was divine. They believed that he had a normal birth, a normal father, and a normal mother, and that Paul was the Antichrist. Paul's agenda was the exact opposite to that of Jesus. In other words, forming a new religion versus reforming Judaism. Many Christians pick and choose the passages they want to believe and ignore others such as, call no man your father. Some of the assertions in today's view are outrageous. For example, kill your disobedient son. There are Bible absurdities. Moses records his own death and the flood story, which is taken from Babylonia, which in turn was taken from Samaria, is anti-science. The world is simply not 6,000 years old. Who wrote the Bible? Who recorded the Garden of Eden story? Who recorded the conversations of Jesus alone in the wilderness with Satan? In addition, some of the basics of Christianity were changed to suit the times such as Jesus originally being depicted as clean-shaven with short hair and empty crucifixes. Religions of the day were intertwined. They borrowed from each other. The ideas of virgin births and a martyred and resurrected savior was common in surrounding cultures. There have been many repeated messiahs, over two dozen. The Jews are still waiting for theirs. Other contemporary religions had trinities Christians adapted this idea 300 years after the time of Christ because Christians could not agree on the very nature of Jesus and a trinity preserved the notion of monotheism, one God. Archaeological evidence simply refutes some of the biblical stories. Nazareth did not exist at the time of Jesus. In addition, if the Gospels are accurate, it seems suspicious that there were no contemporary writings about these spectacular events, such as walking on water, raising the dead, and feeding thousands with what only feed a handful. The Dead Sea Scrolls eliminates the notion of Bible literacy. Just Exodus had 12 different versions to it. Doublets and triplets also discredit the literal Bible, such as Matthew's Sermon on the Mount and Luke's same Sermon on the Plain. Which story is accurate? It's possible they are both wrong. 
canonization was the choice of the church at the time. They only included four of the 150 known Gospels. What authority makes the decision as to what goes in the Bible? Answer, assumed authority. There are numerous mistranslations, some of them unintentional, and some intentional to enhance beliefs. The term Son of God is used by Christian apologists to claim Jesus' divinity, but Son of God did not mean divinity 2,000 years ago. The word kingdom is another example of Christians changing the meaning of words to suit their agenda. Kingdom was repeatedly used by Jesus and did not have anything to do with heaven or following a religious belief for a reward. Kingdom was a description of Israel after it was restored to prosperity once people went back to the Word of God. There is nothing in Scripture to justify the historical distortions such as celibacy, suicide, and abortion. Many cultural misunderstandings have either been overlooked or rationalized by Christians today. The Eucharist story of drinking blood is a horror to Jews, and it shows that the Gospels were not written by witness or Jews. The Gospel writers must have been written by outsiders, probably from different cultures, different languages, and at a later time. The number one Christian dilemma? How could a loving God create evil? To explain Christianity created its devil, its hell, and the concept of free will. None of these answers the question of how a loving God could create evil in the first place. What does this all mean? First of all, biblical literalism is out. To believe that every word or story in the Bible is literally true, when two or more accounts of the same thing are diametrically opposed, makes it impossible to be true. The response that God works in mysterious ways doesn't cut it. Nor should the Bible be considered a historical document. We know that many of the biblical stories, events, and locations have to be wrong due to all of the discrepancies. There is no question that if the world would practice Christian ethics, it would be a vastly better place for everyone. But it's had 2,000 years, and there is still hate, war, and crime. It's quite possible that this account has factual errors, but if half of it were wrong, and it's not, the message would prevail. Radical changes and radical corrections are needed to preserve the faith. Uh, for any issue, I can find a Christian on the other side. You know, some Christians will say homosexuality is a sin, and some Christians will say it's not a sin. Some Christians will say abortion is murder, and some Christians will say it's not murder. So religion really never has produced a unified system of ethics. It actually can't because everybody's going to have a different idea of what God wants. Uh, and so you'll never be able to verify what God wants. So why, why keep using a system that's never worked in the first place? One of the pillars of science is the notion of cause and effect. Every effect, everything that happens, had to have something that caused it. This is pretty elementary. I was educated in the sciences. So after 50 years of research in Christianity, I can sure tell you what I don't believe. I don't believe that 13.7 billion years ago, nothingness got bored and just decided to explode itself, AKA the Big Bang. This is ridiculous. The effect is the world. Science says something had to cause that. Call that cause anything that you want, but just recognize that it's there and had to have had intelligence.